Um, if you have your Bibles, go ahead and turn with me to 1 Peter, 1 Peter chapter 4. 1 Peter chapter 4. And this morning we're going to be reading verses 4, 7 through 11, excuse me, verse 7 through 11. 1 Peter chapter 4, verses 7 through 11. And so last week, the pastor began our um, time talking about being stewards and stewardship. And so uh, I'm going to continue that theme this morning from 1 Peter um, 4 through 7. Before we read the verses, uh, just to give you a little background about who Peter is speaking to, who is Peter writing to. So Peter, the Apostle Peter, is writing to a group of Gentile believers, and he's also writing to a group of Jewish believers that are basically scattered throughout the diaspora. And the diaspora basically is northern Turkey right now, today. It's defined as northern Turkey. So he's writing to these believers who have been exiled from Jerusalem, Uh, because they're beginning to be persecuted um, by this awesome emperor, Nero. Um, So they're fleeing, and when I say awesome, I just mean horrible, right? Uh, They're they're fleeing from this emperor, they're fleeing from persecution. And so Peter is writing to this group of people to encourage them, right? He's writing to them to encourage them because of the social, because of the religious persecution uh, that they're starting to experience, right? And so he's telling them, hey, guys, this is how you need to be living. This is how you need to be when you're living in this hostile foreign land, right? He's giving them some instructions on how to be stewards, right? Who they should be. And so go with me to 1 Peter chapter 4 as we read verses 7 through 11. The end of all things is at hand. Therefore, be self-controlled and sober-minded For the sake of your prayers. Above all, keep loving one another earnestly, since love covers a multitude of sins. Show hospitality to one another without grumbling. As each has received a gift, use it to serve one another as God's, as good stewards of God's varied grace. Whoever speaks is one who speaks oracles of God. Whoever serves is one who serves by the strength that God supplies in order that in everything God may be glorified through Jesus Christ. To him belong glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Amen. Let's pray. Father, uh, we just ask that you would speak through your word this morning. Father, we pray um, that you would teach us. Uh, We pray that you would draw us near. Uh, We pray that our hearts and our minds are ready and focused uh, on you this morning. Uh, We brought all of our baggage here uh, with us, and we just lay it at your feet. Um, And we just pray that you would um, fill this place, God, that you would come in power, that you would whisper softly and gently to us, um, that you would remind us of who you are, remind us of who you want us to be, God. Speak to us this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 All right, so we're talking about stewardship this morning. Stewardship. If you go online and you go to uh, the Webster's Dictionary website, right, because no one uses books anymore. You go to the website and you look up the definition of stewardship. One of the definitions that's there is stewardship means the careful and responsible management of something entrusted to one's care. The careful and responsible management of something entrusted to one's care. So imagine this, right? Imagine that you buy something new. Let's say a car, okay? You bought a new car, and it's an awesome car. You go outside, you stare at it. You envision yourself driving it when you're not driving it, right? What do you do with that car? You wash it, right, Kenji? Right? You wash it. You wax it, right? You stare at it, then you wash it and you wax it, then you shine the tires up, right? You keep it clean, 
then you stare at it some more. You just sit inside and smell it because it smells so good, right? It's a new car. It's my new car, right? When your kids get inside, you say, don't eat in my car, right? A week from now, I don't want to see a fry under my car seat. Don't eat in my car, right? That's what my mom would say. <laughs> and that's what I say. Don't be eating on car, right? I don't want to see any crumbs, any Cheetos, any Cheerios in my car. I'm keeping it clean, right? I wash it. I wax it. I stare at it. I shine those rims. I take care of it, right? I take care of my possession because I value it. In this case, because I bought it, because it's mine, right? So that's a form of stewardship. You have these things and you take care of your things and you keep them looking good. You keep them in good condition. That is stewardship. But we're not talking about really that form of stewardship, right? Biblically, stewardship goes a little deeper than just what you have. It goes a little deeper than your possessions, right? And it goes a little deeper than that because God isn't just concerned about what you physically have, right? He's concerned about your life. He's concerned about who you are, right? So when we talk about stewardship, let's think about it. What does stewardship mean in Paul's mind, in Peter's mind? When they talk about stewardship, what are they talking about? And Paul talks about it a lot, actually, in his letters to the church. And we're going to go through a few of those scriptures right now. When Paul talks about stewardship, what is he saying? So in 1 Corinthians 9, in 1 Corinthians 9, 16 and 17. 1 Corinthians 9, 16 and 17. Paul says this. He says, For if I preach the gospel, that gives me no ground for boasting, for necessity is laid upon me, Woe to me if I do not preach the gospel. For I do this, for if I do this of my own will, I have a reward. But if not of my own will, I am still entrusted with the stewardship. I am still entrusted with the stewardship. Ephesians 3, 1 through 5. Ephesians 3, 1 through 5. What does Paul think when he's thinking about stewardship? Ephesians 3. For this reason I, Paul, a prisoner of Christ Jesus, on behalf of you Gentiles, assuming that you have heard of the stewardship of God's grace that was given to me for you, how the mystery was made known to me by revelation, as I have written briefly. When you read this, you can perceive my insight into the mystery of Christ, which was not made known to the sons of men in other generations, as it has now been revealed to his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit. Colossians 1, 24 and 26. Colossians chapter 1, verse 24 through 26. What does Paul think about stewardship? 24 through 26. Now I rejoice in my sufferings for your sake, and in my flesh I am filling up what is lacking in Christ's afflictions for the sake of his body, that is his church, of which I became a minister according to the stewardship from God, that was given to me for you to make known the word of God, to make the word of God fully known, the mystery hidden for ages and generations, but now revealed to his saints. And Peter specifically, and we'll get to this verse a little later, but he says in 1 Peter 4.10, what does he say? He says, as each has received a gift, use it to serve one another as God's good stewards, of good stewards of God's varied grace. So we know that a part of stewardship is taking care of what you have, right? But biblically, when Paul and when Peter, when they're talking about stewardship and in their mind, they are stewards of what? The mysteries of God, right? They're stewards of the mysteries of God. They're stewards of his grace, his varied grace, right? And because of their good stewardship, because they took care of what they were given, we are actually recipients of that. How do I know that? Because you're sitting here, right? Because they did their job to preach the good news 
and it changed the world. Because of their stewardship, we are changed. Right? We aren't Paul, I know. We aren't Peter, I know. Right? We aren't those guys, but we are still stewards. We are still stewards. And so we remember, why is Peter writing this letter to these people? What is his purpose, right? Why is he writing to these scattered believers? One, to encourage them to bring honor to God in the foreign land, right? To be good stewards. We aren't Peter and Paul, but we are still called to be stewards in the same way that they are. And how is that? All right, I'm going to tell you. So when Peter is writing to these people, he, he, he tells them, all right, guys, be good stewards. And I'm going to give you three ways on how you can be good stewards in this hostile land that you're in right now. Number one, you are a good steward by being self-controlled, by being sober-minded. You are a good steward by, being, by loving deeply, right? And you are a good steward by using what you've been given. By being self-controlled and sober-minded, by loving deeply, and by using what you've been given. Let's look at verse 7. The end of all things is at hand. Therefore, be self-controlled and sober-minded for the sake of your prayers. Be self-controlled and sober-minded, right? Have you ever tried to do anything when you're tired? What's that like? Yeah. <laughs> I'm not going to say that from up here, but yes. It's not good. When you're trying to accomplish things that need to be accomplished and you're tired, right? You're not clear-minded, right? It's painful. It's painful. What's it like trying to drive when you're tired, when you're not sober-minded, when you're not clear-minded, when you're not fully awake? What's that like? Think about it. It's hard, right? It's hard to stay in the lanes. And you have these markers in the lanes. If you go over them, they'll, they'll try to wake you up. Get back in your lane. Wake up, right? They reflect the light to try to keep you awake, right? It's hard to drive when you're tired. What's it like trying to watch a movie when you're tired? When you're not sober-minded? When you're not clear-minded? What happens? What? Right? What's it like trying to have a conversation when you're tired, when you're not sober-minded, when you're not clear-minded. What's that like? What? Right? It's hard. You can't really pay attention. You can't remember what the person said or what the person was talking about, and it makes them feel unimportant, like you don't care. Right? can't have meaningful conversations when you're not sober-minded, when you're not clear-minded. What's prayer? What is prayer? It's a conversation, right? It's a conversation, right? And what is Peter saying? The reason to be sober-minded, self-controlled, for what? For the sake of what? Your prayers. So what is prayer? It's a conversation. What's it like trying to have a conversation when you're tired, when you're not sober-minded, when you're not clear-minded? It's hard. And prayer is a conversation, right? So when you're not sober-minded, when you're not self-controlled, What's your prayer like? Is your prayer effective? Is your prayer getting out of your head? Is your prayer reaching the heart and the ears of God? Right? Is it doing that? 
We've already established it's really hard, almost impossible to do anything when you're tired, when you're not clear-minded, when you're not sober-minded. And if we know that prayer is a conversation, right? So for the sake of our communion, for the sake of your communion with God, be sober, be clear, be self-controlled. And that's not just like something that it's, it's, you say it and, and we encourage you to do it and if you don't do it, it'll be okay. There's a consequence if you don't. There's a consequence if you're not found self-controlled and sober-minded and clear-minded. What is the consequence? Look at 1 Peter 5.8. He reminds us again, be sober-minded. Be watchful. Why? Because your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour. Be sober-minded because you have an enemy that is walking around like a lion stalking you, right? That's accusing you day and night before God. So be sober-minded so you can overcome him, right? In your moments of temptation, in your moments of need. Be sober-minded. Number two, we are good stewards by loving each other deeply or earnestly. We are good stewards by loving each other deeply, earnestly. Verse 8 and 9. Above all, keep loving one another earnestly, since love covers a multitude of sins. Show hospitality to one another without grumbling. So what does that mean, to love deeply, to love earnestly? Think about that. What does that mean to love deeply, to love earnestly? Somebody shout it out. What does that mean? What do you think that means? Sacrifice? Okay. Anything else? Just sacrifice? All right. Giving? Okay. Forgiving? Okay. Anyone else? Obeying, okay, that's good. These are all good. I'm not going to be like, no, it's not right. You don't know what it means. (laughs) I'm going to tell you what love means. I am, I am going to tell you. (laughs) Can I get uh, one volunteer? Kenji. Ken J, come on up, my brother. What does it mean to love earnestly, to love earnestly? Deeply. Those are all good meanings to that, right? Yeah, stretch that out. Stretch that out. That's good. That's good. All right. Just wrap it around like this. Get a good get a good grip. Get a good grip. So when Peter is telling his people, love each other deeply. Love each other deeply. Because that kind of love covers a multitude of sin, right? He's not so much talking about the the feeling, the sentimentality of loving someone. We, We know what that is, right? He uses a different kind of word when he says to love someone deeply. Pull on that really hard. Just pull. Just pull. Pull as hard as you can, like we're in a tug of war. Yep, that's right. Pull. Pull me across. You got it. Keep going. Oh, yeah. Yes. Yes. Keep pulling. Yeah. When Peter says, love each other deeply, he uses a word that gives a connotation of of strain, right? Of strain, of stretching, pulling, of this tension. This is what he's saying. Love each other deeply. Love each other deeply because this kind of love This kind 
is what covers sin. Right? It's that kind. Thank you, Kenji. Yeah, that really hurt. <laughs> oh. I, I can just put it back. You don't have to take it. Okay. Remember that. Remember it. It's that kind of love. The kind that stretches. The kind that is strained. The kind that hurts your hand when you're doing it. Right? It gives this connotation of the muscles when you see an athlete trying to compete and strain to win the race. Is that kind of love. That hard love. Let me get that back. Sorry. No, let me get it back. I still need it. Sorry, you don't have to wrap it up. <laughs> I'm just going to unwrap it again. Is that kind of love. Look. <laughs> it's the hard love, right? It's the hard love. The kind that stretches, the kind that strains. And this kind of love is not blind. This kind of love is not blind. It still sees your sin. It still sees your shortcomings. It still sees your falls. This kind. Not the kind that just gives you a card on your birthday and says, I love you. Right? The kind that when you do the worst, the worst, it still strains and it still stretches to meet you where you are to cover you. It's that kind of love that Jesus loves us with, right? And it's that kind of love that Peter says to love each other with. Love each other with. What kind of love? What kind of love is that? Paul talks about it. Paul talks about it. What does he say? He says, the kind of love that is patient, the kind of love that is kind, the kind of love that does not envy or boast, this kind of love is not arrogant or rude, it does not insist on its own way. This kind of love is not irritable or resentful. It doesn't rejoice at wrongdoing. It rejoices with the truth. This love bears all things. It believes all things. It hopes all things. And it endures all things. Be a good steward. Be a good steward and love each other deeply. Made me sweaty. And lastly, what does he, Peter, tell us to do? He says, be a good steward and use what you have to serve and to minister to other people. Verses 10 and 11. As each has received a gift, use it to serve one another as good stewards of God's varied grace. Whoever speaks is one who speaks oracles of God. Whoever serves is one who serves by the strength that God supplies. In order that in everything God may be glorified through Jesus Christ. To him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. So be a good steward and use what you have to serve and minister to others. Why? Why is that important? Why do I need to use what I've been given to serve, given to serve and minister to other people? Because the gifts that you have, number one, no one else has them. The gifts that God has given you through them, when you use them, we experience God's grace. We experience God's grace. Everyone else around you experiences God's grace. 
when you use what God has given you, all of us have the opportunity to testify to God's goodness. We see what he's doing in you, and we can say God is good. That even though we all deserve to be separated from him because of what we've done, I see God working in you, and I see that we've been grafted in, right? And we've been adopted, and we can be a part of his kingdom and his rule here on earth because I see that he's using you and that he's working in you. So what happens if you keep that to yourself? If you don't minister and serve to other people, right? If you keep the light that you have hidden and you deprive, you deprive yourself, number one. You deprive yourself from seeing God glorified in your life. And also, you deprive us, the church, from seeing God glorified. You know what inspires people more than anything else? A story. Stories inspire us more than anything else, right? A story of someone overcoming something, right? Or a story that they write themselves, right? A story is what inspires us. Or even just the desire to write your own story, to change your own life, right? It inspires you. And it's a benefit to you, and it's a benefit to the people that will come after you. You know what another word for story is? Testimony. Testimony. Do you know how we overcome the one who stands before God and accuses us? day and night, night and day. Do you know how we overcome him? What's the song? We have overcome by the blood of the lamb and the word of our everyone overcomes. We overcome by our story, by our testimony right? There's power written. There's power for you and there's power for us because we need to see it. So use your gifts. Don't hide your light. Doesn't matter what you do, whether you're up here speaking, whether you're up here serving, whether you're at your job, at your house, wherever. Use your gifts. Use what God has given you because the world needs it. Because we need it. So be a good steward. Be sober-minded. Be self-controlled. Love deeply. Right? Use your gifts for his glory. Why? Why? Because Peter said it at the beginning. He said what in verse 7? The end of all things is at hand. Why be a good steward? Why be sober-minded? Why love deeply? Why use your gifts for his glory? Because the end of all things is at hand. Why would you play that? What does that have to do with anything? So I actually, I'm reading this woman's book right now. It's called Give Work. Um. And she talks about how to attack poverty, right? Just another way to attack it through giving work instead of just giving aid, right? It's really good. It's really good. It gets you to think a lot about poverty and just in a different way, right? And how you can use who you are and what you're passionate about to change the world. Layla died on January 24th of this year. She died from a rare form of cancer. She announced that she had it in April of 2019, 
and she died on January 24th. And I had ordered her book before I even know that she passed. As I'm reading the book, I'm just, you know, Googling her story. Oh, she literally just passed. I played this video because you don't actually know how much time you have. Right? Layla had future plans to change the world literally through her business. She had just gotten married. She had every intention to live for a long time. But she died when she was 37. 37. You don't know how much time you have. So redeem it. Use it. In the time that you have, be a good steward. You are a steward of God's gifts, and you are a steward of his graces. You know what stewards do? They manage, right? They manage someone else's business. That's the job of a steward. So stewards don't actually own anything. You don't actually own your own life. Stewards manage and administer their master's wealth according to their master's will and their master's discretion. So we know what to do, right? We be self-controlled and sober-minded, and we love each other deeply, and we use our gifts for his glory because we're stewards and, you know, we're managing what God has given us, the grace that he's given us. We don't actually own anything. We don't even own our own life. So the question that I'll leave with you is how are you managing your life for God's glory? That's the question. That's what you have to decide. You have to. Even if you don't decide, you decide. So be a good steward. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Father, we thank you um, just for your word. God, we thank you that you don't leave us as orphans. You don't leave us alone. You've come and you, you guide us and you give us your word to be boundaries for us, to be a light for us. God, and we just thank you that you speak to us, and you thank, we thank you that you draw us near to you. We thank you that you perfect us, that you make us holy, that you've made us holy, you've made us righteous, and you keep doing that every day. And so we just pray that you will give us hearts to submit to you, because we don't actually own anything. And we come and we try to build our own kingdoms and have our own possessions when nothing that we actually have is ours. So just help us to have the right mindset and the right heart to view ourselves the way that you view us, to humble ourselves, to submit to you, and to live for you, and to love each other, God. Father, we love you and we thank you, Jesus. Amen.